In the previous video, I was talking about various forms of Borsuk, the borsuk ulam theorem, and I said that the purpose of doing that was so that we would be able to apply it to prove combinatorial results. And now I'm going to prove some combinatorial results, as promised. Um, I'm going to start with a solution to a very nice problem, which you may have seen. Um, the problem I'm talking about, which is, uh, well, I'll state it in a, in a form that's quite nice. So can you find a triangle-free graph with chromatic number? At least 2020. And as you might guess, this problem tends to get updated with each passing year. Um, there are many ways of doing this. And so although I'm about to tell you a solution to this, uh, that doesn't spoil the problem because there remains the problem, find a completely different way of doing it. And that's a very nice problem if you haven't seen the answer. Actually, I know of at least three completely different approaches of which this is one, and there are probably more as well. So. Um, but this approach uses the Borsuk-Ulam theorem. Um, so the answer is yes. And in fact, we'll do something a bit uh, more general, of course, uh, and a little bit stronger. So when I say stronger, instead of going for triangle free, we're actually going to go for um, graphs that don't have any short odd cycles. And I will just tell you straight away what the graph is. So. Um, fix n and n's an integer and some epsilon greater than zero and define a graph it's going to be a graph with uncountably many vertices not that that's very important uh, because you can always discretize it actually so define a graph with vertex set sn um, by joining x to y, if the angle um, x, y is at least uh, pi minus epsilon. So just to have a picture in your head, I'm taking a high dimensional sphere. And I'm joining two points if they're almost antipodal. So there's the origin. Uh, the angle is almost as big as uh, pi, so that's pi minus some tiny little bit, call it delta, and then delta is smaller than epsilon. So those are the edges of the graph, and what remains to prove is that we can't color this graph in such a way as to, uh, as to avoid ever having two edges that are almost antipodal to each other um, of the same color. And I think given the clue that we're going to use the borsuk ulam theorem, it's actually a very simple exercise at this stage, just to complete the proof, but I will um, do it for you. So suppose uh, that sets C1 up to Cn plus 1 partition this graph, or partition the vertex set, which is Sn, so these sets aren't closed and they're not open. So so far there's not much we can say, but what we're going to do is, uh, I think epsilon over two will do. So for each i, let um, ai be ci uh, epsilon, where this time I don't mean the open expansion, although I could make two epsilon uh, and do the open epsilon, uh, the open expansion. I'm, but just for convenience, I'm going to make it the closed exp expansion. And what I mean by the closed expansion is not quite um, what one might necessarily think. So it's a bit, let's say exactly what it is. It's the set of all x such that. Um, the distance, okay, I have to say what I mean by the distance in a moment, but from the, first of all, I want to say that the distance from X to CI is less than or equal to epsilon, and now I want to specify that the distance is the sort of spherical distance rather than the Euclidean distance. So what I mean by that is, um, 
i.e. Uh, inf of angle from x to y with y in ci uh, is less than or equal to epsilon. Um, I may I reserve the right to change that epsilon to a two epsilon. I'm actually uh, now slightly anxious that it should be a two epsilon uh, to give myself a little bit of elbow room. But uh, let's see what we can do now. So uh, the sets CI are closed and cover SN. So um, by Borsuk Ulam, uh, we can find some x and i such that both x and minus x belong to ci. And that implies that the distance, so when I said 2 epsilon, I also reserved the right to change it to epsilon over 2. So the distance from x um, to ai and the distance from minus x to ai are both less than or equal to, uh, let's be really safe. So both less than or equal to epsilon over three. Um, so let's find um, u in ai and v in ai such that the distance from x to u is less than or equal to epsilon over two the distance from minus x to v is less than or equal to epsilon over 2 and then that implies um, that the angle between u and v is greater than or equal to pi minus epsilon over 2 minus epsilon over 2 or pi minus epsilon so uv is an edge and that finishes it off because uh, we took an arbitrary coloring, C1 up to Cn plus one. Um, ah, I've made a mistake here because I said the sets Ci are closed because I'd used the letter C, but of course here I meant the sets Ai are closed. I started off with some arbitrary sets. Um, so I've mixed up my Ai's and Ci's here, but that's not the end of the world. Um, so let's just get them all the right, right way around. Um, so now I've found u and v of the same colour where the angle is big uh, and the angle being big means that uh, uv forms an edge so it's not a proper colouring and that's other words a completely arbitrary colouring. So the borsuk ulam theorem in the closed sets version is not quite but sort of up to a perturbation it's more or less equivalent to saying that um, a high dimensional sphere with this sort of graph has um, a high chromatic number. And uh, just, I haven't talked about uh, having no triangles, but we can see that this has no triangles because if you go from here to here and then you take another edge, you're forced to be, um, so this angle was least pi minus epsilon, which means when you get back, the angle between this and the next point is at most two epsilon. Um, so it's certainly not going to be at least uh, pi minus epsilon and after a few steps so roughly speaking the length of this, the shortest odd cycle is going to be proportional to one over epsilon that's pretty simple to prove uh, so if you want it not to contain any five cycles or seven cycles you just make sure that epsilon is substantially smaller than one over seven good uh, now let's move on to a rather meatier result although it's going to have a very short proof uh, and for that, I'm going to define something called the Knazer graph. Uh, 
By the way, I showed you this example um, because I wanted slightly to demystify the use of the Borsa Coulomb theorem in combinatorics. And I think here we see a very direct use of the Borsa Coulomb theorem. And it'll make um, the, the result I'm about to talk about a bit less surprising. Uh, I'll come back to this question of surprise in mathematics in just a moment. Um, but let's just say what the Kinesa graph is. So it's denoted, or I'll denote it by GNK. Uh, the vertex set is going to be the set 2n plus k by integers from 1 up to 2n plus k. And we'll, uh, sorry, subsets of that of size n. So it's the n sets living inside 2n plus k. And we'll join a set A to a set B, if and only if A intersect B is empty. So we join them if and only if they're disjoint. So the point that I want to slightly draw your attention to is that uh, if you think about these sets as being vectors, then A and B being disjoint is sort of saying that the angle between A and B is quite large. So there's a sort of similarity between this and what I've just done, although it's not completely obvious how to exploit that similarity, that has to be said. But the question is, and the question asked by Knezer was, what is the chromatic number, which I'll denote by chi, of GNK? So how many colours do you need uh, if you want to have a proper colouring? You don't want to have two edges uh, I mean, you don't want to have two, an edge joining two vertices of the same colour. Well, Knezer observed that uh, there's a very simple colouring that will work. So it goes like this. So um, the following how many things? But the following colouring I can't do enough wiggles is proper. Uh, so, if the maximum element of A belongs to the set n, uh, sorry, 2n, 2n plus 1 up to 2n plus k, then uh, colour A by its maximum and then otherwise as I put all remaining sets so all the sets where the maximum is less than 2n into a single color class right why did, what do we need in order for that to work we need that we've never colored two disjoint sets with the same color well, if it's one of these colors, then uh, if, if they have the same color, they share their maximum element, so they're certainly not disjoint. And if they're one of the, if they belong to the uh, leftover color class, that says that we have two sets of size n that live in one up to two n minus one, and then there aren't enough elements for them to be disjoint. So that's a proper coloring. Either the maximum is less than two n, in which case uh, any two of those will be uh, definitely not disjoint, they'll have to intersect, or then they have the same maximum, in which case they trivially intersect. So it's a very simple colouring that uh, is proper. How many colours are there? Well, just here we've got uh, k plus one colours, everything from 2n up to 2n plus k inclusive, so that makes k plus one colours. And here we have one remaining colour class. So here we've got a k plus two colouring. And Knezer conjectured that uh, that was the best you could do, that uh, you couldn't find a proper k plus one colouring of this Knezer graph. And this conjecture was very famously proved by Laszlo Lovas um, using the Borsa Coulomb theorem. And the proof, so, I said I was going to say something about surprise in mathematics, so the proof came as an enormous surprise. So although I've tried to demystify 
the proof a little bit by saying, here's a simple application of Borza Ulam, and here's a graph that looks a little bit like uh, um, the graph that we applied to Borza Ulam theorem too, where you had angles between vectors being large. Uh, nevertheless, um, you know, it's very easy to say that kind of thing with hindsight, and Lovas was acting without hindsight at all. And also, as I say, even if you've got the hint that you can use the borsuk ulam theorem to, to prove this result, I recommend actually, if you want to, just hit pause and go away and see if you can just sort of trivially apply the borsuk ulam theorem to prove that the Kinesi graph has uh, chromatic number k plus two. Let me know if you manage it. Um, otherwise, uh, carry on watching. But this wasn't the end of the story, actually, because a few weeks, I think it was something like two or three weeks or something, but very, very short time after Lovas's proof hit the headlines, uh, Imre Barani came up with a much simpler proof. So it also used the borsuk ulam theorem, but somehow uh, he organized it in such a way that it was just a very, very short argument. Um, and for years, maybe even decades, uh, you know, when that happens, you sort of think, oh, right, you know, when you see a, a much simpler proof of a, of, a, of a theorem, you sort of assume that that much simpler proof is what people like to call a proof from the book, in case you don't know what that is. Uh, the famous mathematician Paul Erdős had this idea of proofs from the book, which are proofs that exist in God's ultimate textbook of uh, all mathematics, which has optimal proofs of everything. Um, but that belief that Birani's uh, proof was a proof from the book turned out to be incorrect because um, there was a further development when a mathematician called Joshua Green found an even simpler proof. And that's the proof I'm going to talk about. And another notable thing about Green, um, Green's proof was that Green was, um, I believe, an undergraduate at the time, certainly extremely young. But it sort of came as a shock because everybody had been complacently assuming that Barani's proof was about as good as you could get. Okay, uh, so actually what Green first did was um, prove or just ob observe the um, the fact that uh, from the borsuk ulam theorem you get that mixed statement. So the statement that if uh, a1 up to a n plus 1 cover Sn and are open or closed, this is the statement we'll use, then we can find some Ai that contains a pair of antipodal points. So how are we going to use this? Well, we've got to, right, what we're going to do, we're going to start with a colouring of, uh, so we've got to, we're claiming that uh, we cannot find a proper K plus one colouring of, um, the vertex set of the Kinesi graph, so 2n plus k subsets of size n thereof. Um, now we're going to do something which is the sort of key to transforming this problem from um, a problem about 2n plus k n into something that talks about the sphere. So let uh, x subset of s k plus one um, be a set of size 2n plus k in general position. And keep the key property we need is that uh, no hyperplane contains more points than it needs to. So 
in particular, uh, no. So SK plus one lives inside um, R K plus two. So no K plus one dimensional subspace of R K plus two contains more than k plus one points of x. And then what I'm going to say is uh, we can we can find a bijection between the integers from one to two n plus k and x. So without lots of generality, it's just simpler to think of it this way. Uh, C one up to C k plus one is a colouring instead of the sets of size n inside x, subsets of x of size n. So we've got our set of points scattered around the sphere in a nice general way and uh, we're taking the subsets of that of size n and we take a colouring of that. Now I've got, in order to apply borsuk ulam, I've got to define some uh, open or closed subsets of SK plus one, and it's SK plus one, so I'm allowed uh, K plus two of them. And here's how I'm going to do it. Uh, so for one less than or equal to I less than or equal to K plus one, um, uh, I, should, I should have said this first, but actually I will say it first. Let's get rid of that for a second. So for each X, let, uh, hx denote the open hemisphere that's centered at x and we can write down an expression for that so it's the set of all y in s k plus one such that the angle between x and y is strictly greater than zero so there's a picture if x is up here then it's everything that lies strictly above um, the equator, so to speak, if x is the North Pole. And now for each i, or for one less than or equal to i less than or equal to k plus one, let ai equal a set of all x such that um, there exists an a that belongs to ci such that, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what this is exactly saying, such that A is a subset of HX. So remember what CI is, each CI is a collection of sets of size N um, from X, and X was a, set of, a subset of the sphere of size 2N plus K. So each A is a set of N points, and I'm just gonna pick all x such that when I look inside the hemisphere uh, centered at x, I can find inside that hemisphere um, n points that form a set that belongs to the color class ci. Now we can see that uh, because hx is an open hemisphere, um, this is going to be a union of, an inter of intersections of sets that are definitely open. So uh, each AI is open. Um, but I don't know that these AIs are going to cover the whole sphere. Um, but uh, that's okay because I've only used K plus one colors so far. So let's let A naught be everything else. So take away the union of these colors. So now I've got uh, K plus two colors, uh, or take K plus two sets. All of the AIs were open, and then this is a complement of an open set, so A naught is closed, and that's why I'm using the mixed version. So by mixed also Uram, some AI 
contains a pair of antipodal points, which I'll write x minus x. Now it remains to find a contradiction. So um, if one is less than or equal to i is less than or equal to k, we'll get a, as so a k plus one, I mean, we'll get a, a contradiction in one way. Uh, then hx and h minus x contain sets in color class ci. But if you've got a set that's contained, hx and h minus x are disjoint sets. One is the sort of northern hemisphere, not including the equator, and the other is the southern hemisphere, so to speak, not including the equator. Uh, so that's a contradiction. So, but that implies that the color class CI, which consists of subsets of X, uh, contains two disjoint sets. But two disjoint sets are joined in a Knese graph. Uh, we were hoping that this would be a, a proper coloring. Or if you don't want to say that we're proving by contradiction, we just say we have established that this is not a proper coloring because we've managed to find two disjoint sets that belong to the same color class. That still leaves one other case. What if x and x naught, uh, x and minus x both belong to a naught? So if x and minus x live in a naught, then hx uh, and h minus x contain no sets in any CI. Now the CIs, this, these colors, they were a coloring of XN. So they, they um, um, all sets of size N um, belong to at least one color. So that implies straight away that uh, hx and h minus x contain at most n minus one points each. Why? Because let's suppose that hx contained more than n, I mean at least n points, then uh, just pick a set of n points in hx, that's got to have a color if that color is ci, then hx does contain a set in ci. So it's trivial that uh, hx and x, h minus x must contain at most n minus one points each. So therefore, um, the complement of the union of hx and h minus x contains at least 2n plus k minus 2 n minus 1 equals k plus 2 points. But the complement of uh, hx union h minus x is the equator, i.e. it is a k plus 1, it's the intersection of sk plus 1 with a k plus 1 dimensional subspace. So this contradicts the fact that uh, X is in general position. And that's the end of the proof. And I don't think I've got any morals to draw. I just think it's a beautiful argument um, and a little taste of uh, the use of topological theorems to prove results in combinatorics. And with that, I shall stop.